Welcome to Babblecom 5. This is episode 1 of season 3 of Babylon 5. This season is entitled Point of No Return. This episode is called Matters of Honour. The station is getting pieced back together after the events of last season's finale. Kosh hasn't been returning Sheridan's calls, saying it was a strain to be seen by so many at once, and he went back to his ship to rest. Sheridan asks him why he chose to reveal himself at all, even though no one has realised it was him. It was necessary. Sheridan asks if it's always the same of all on who comes back in the encounter suit when he leaves the station. I have always been here. We're making a query that gets yes as an answer when it deserved much more. I really hate it when you do that, says Sheridan. Good, says Kosh. That's as funny as Volons get, and probably the most dialogue we've ever had from Kosh in the first two minutes of the third season. As they part company, the scene switches to a ringed planet and a drowsy sunhawk fleeing towards open space under, bar under a barrage of fire from weapons platforms. Once almost in clear space, the drowsy pilot ejects a smaller ship that breaks for freedom as the sunhawk is finally caught by the concentrated fire. The unshaven human pilot thanks Drozak quietly and plots a course for Babylon 5, and then jumps out. Ooh, um, spoilers in the new intro sequence, I would suggest that you skip it until you've actually seen this episode. The human pilot orders life support cut to a minimum and power diverted to engines as he powers to Babylon 5, still hours away. Meanwhile, Mr. Ndawi arrives on the station from Earth with a matter to discuss with Delenn, Ivanova and Sheridan, as the pilot from the ship is brought into the new med lab facility unconscious. Or seemingly so, because as soon as Franklin finishes speaking to another doctor on the comm, he turns to find him gone. We know of course he's a ranger, based on the brooch Franklin examined whilst he was briefly horizontal. On the promenade, Londo is looking to end his association with his dear Mr. Morden. Whilst Morden keeps his cool, we also hear his associates whispering to him, and it seems there is some bookkeeping to be done later. But seemingly he is content to go away, despite noting that the Centauri is still moving on other worlds and might need their assistance. Mr. Undari is looking into Keffer's gun camera footage from last year, and is hoping that as the Minbari are the oldest race he can sensibly speak to, Delenn might recognise the ship. Sheridan notes that Keffer's trips were unauthorised and that he was discouraged from pursuing them. Delenn says she has never seen the ship type before, despite being pressed. Once Ndari leaves, Sheridan asks her if it's a shadow vessel, which she confirms, but says she didn't lie. She's generally never seen one directly before, but she assumes it is one based on descriptions from the last Great War. She could not tell him that, because, recapping what we know from last season, exposing the shadows now could cause them to move before they are ready for them. She says these ships are essentially invincible, never giving up until they've destroyed their target. Sheridan's experience says otherwise, harking back to his encounter with the Minbari battlecruiser believed to be unkillable. Delenn is not convinced. Lanier catches up with Delenn and shows her a range of brooch, saying someone is looking for her, and they change direction in the corridor. Mr Ndawi has caught up with Londo, whose duties apparently encompass drinking as a duty, so he's not conflicted by drinking whilst they meet. On being shown the shadow ship, Malari doesn't recognise it as such, but recalls his death dream in which he believes he is on Centauri Prime as huge numbers of these ships pass overhead, and he believes it to be a bad omen. That is all he can say. Alien bartender is doing a passable Tom Cruise cocktail impression as a hooded Delenn and Lanier enter a disreputable establishment and down below. They are met by Marcus, a ranger who reclaims his brooch, having demonstrated that he knows better than to give Minbari alcohol, which most do not. He was the pilot of the little ship we saw earlier. The brooch is said to be forged from holy water, Minbari blood, human blood, and to shed three tears, two of blood, one of water, when its owner dies. However, he notes he no longer believes in miracles when Delenn asks, saying that part of his heart died a long time ago. Their departure does not go unnoticed, and the local thug squad does not take kindly to Marx's quips. However, with the aid of an old Minbari fighting pike, their assailants are dealt with, and they move on. It turns out Ivanova has already briefed herself on the rangers, saying that the day she doesn't know when something's happening on the station, they should worry. 
Marcus explains he escapes from Zagros 7, a drowsy colony on the edge of their space, where they have a large training camp on the basis of, as Lanier puts it, not putting all your eggs in one basket, also noting that not all Minbari are comfortable with the rangers being trained on Minbar. Marcus explains that Zagros 7 has been blockaded by Centauri mines that shoot down any ship trying to leave, and they need the blockade disrupted long enough to get the rangers out. The Drazi are occupied by Centauri incursions elsewhere, and the planet is basically worthless to them, so they won't help. Garibaldi notes they don't have the resources to help, but Marcus says they have the means if the captain will help. It's a bit cheesy, but basically he decides it's time to go on the offensive, and leaves Mr Garibaldi in charge of dealing with Mr Undawi. A shuttle and a Minbari flyer head out. Mr Morden carves up the galaxy with Londo, noting in response to his query about the shadows coming after him that they both know what treaties mean. But he says as long as they have their area, they're content, with one exception, Zagros 7. He's already asked Reefer to secure it with blockade mines, which of course he's done, and he encourages any Centauri ships to not be around when his associates come to claim the planet. Londo asks him if he could see the ships they use one day, which Mr. Warden gives a very lukewarm response to. Meanwhile, Sheridan's nano fleet drops into normal space at a rendezvous point to discover a strangely beautiful ship waiting for them that Marcus describes as a beginning. She is the White Star, and Marcus tells Sheridan that she's his. All his birthdays come at once. Back on the station, Garibaldi suggests that Mr. Ndari should speak to Jakar on an unofficial basis given the new treaty with the Centauri, and he promises he won't tell himself about the meeting he's just suggested. As Mr. Ndari notes, it's a strange place. On the White Star, Delenn notes that it is a blending of Minbari and Vorlon technology, so it looks different to Minbari ships, and is faster than most of them, with the unusual ability for a ship its size to form its own jump points. Sheridan notes the gravity, with Delenn noting that the Minbari have had artificial gravity for some time as an offshoot of the magnetogravitic drive systems they use. Ivanova would like to take two. Interestingly, it's crewed by religious cast Minbari, owing to the issues with the warrior cast. Not all of the Grey Council know its existence, even. Lanier will act as liaison, as not all the crew know English yet. They jump for Zagros 7. Mr Undari meets with Jakar, who explains that over a thousand Earth years ago, before the Narn became spacefaring, the Shadows set up a base on Narn on a southern continent. The Book of Jaquan, he shows in Darwi, has an image of the Shadow Vessel, and it was Jaquan who, himself who believed that the Shadows were fighting a great war far away, although they left the Narn alone. And Dari wonders why they would turn up 1,000 years later, to which Jakar responds that for everything there is a time, and this may be theirs. Marcus and Ivanova have a brief conversation that establishes Marcus took, took a place in the Rangers at his brother's request, he having been a Ranger prior, who was killed in a shadow attack on Marcus's mining colony. At Zagros 7, if one of them bans the weapons system and starts taking out blockade mines, but Sheridan is concerned by the lack of Centauri ships in the system. Lanier gives him a holographic display of the system to his amazement, and then Ivanova notes a new arrival. It's a shadow vessel. Capital class. Delenn is clearly shocked. Sheridan keeps a cooler head being warrior cast. He orders Ivanova to take evasive action but keep clearing the mines. The shadow vessel opens up but misses to Delenn's surprise. However, Sheridan surmises that they don't recognise them, so they're shooting to wound, not kill. With enough mines gone, the rangers bug out while Sheridan orders the White Star to escape via the local jump gate, not wishing to tip their ability to form their own jump point. The shadow vessel phases into hyperspace to pursue, to pursue them. Delenn doesn't think they can take on a mainline shadow vessel, but again, there's a backhanded reference from Sheridan to his defeat of the Black Star, which was equally improbable at the time. He quizzes Ivanova on his idea of opening a jump point whilst inside a jump gate. She says Earth thought about it during the Minbari War and termed it a bonehead manoeuvre, no offence to those present, because no Earth ship could get out of the way fast enough to avoid the enormous energy discharge that would ensue. Sheridan asks Lanier, who very honestly has no idea whether the White Star is fast enough to clear the blast radius. Sheridan is going to risk it anyway, using the Markab system's jump gate, which is now expendable, as it's only being used by grave robbers after they died off last year. Delenn is way out of her comfort zone, but agrees that he can go ahead. So the White Star jumps in using the gate, 
then triggers its aft jump engines as soon as it hits normal space, creating two competing jump points inside the gate itself. That competition results in a massive energy blast that consumes the shadow vessel as it drops into normal space next to the gate to continue its pursuit. We see it briefly hit by the wave as the white star burns away from the gate in the resulting shockwave. It's singed, losing power briefly, but escapes serious harm and the flyer and shuttle return to Babylon 5 with the captain and Delenn concocting a story for the departing and dowry as cover, which he seems to swallow. On Earth, Indari reports in that no one positively ID'd the ship, and to the shock of everyone who's followed the series to this point, Morden appears to speak with the Earth Dome official who debriefed Indari, together with the Psycop. Whilst Morden is happy no one aside from the Narn, who of course are no longer a real threat, knew of the ship, the Psycop notes that it could still be an opportunity to expand the program back home, whatever that is. Back on the station, Sheridan is convening the first war council, so that all of the senior staff are officially in the loop, along with Marcus or whichever ranger is around. Franklin is the least in the picture to date, so the episode ends with Delenn telling him of the origins of the ancient shadows. So, boom today! We're now at the point in the show where, two years on, it's very, very hard to try and cram that history into a new season's opener, but JMS tries hard here. And whilst it feels a little contrived in places, it's not ridiculous, even if there are some cheesy moments. It's nice to see that the station is still under repair, it hasn't magically fixed itself in the course of a week or so in station time. Also, that, that being seen by so many took it out of Kosh for whatever reason. This makes me feel that he does have to actively respond to those seeing him, even if some of their response is built in. Clearly a one-to-one -one scenario would be easier for him. I'm just reminding myself because my son would probably call me on using a him pronoun for being of energy. Oh well. We get a nice uh, guest spot from Tucker Smallwood, who at the time I knew from Space Above and Beyond. Remember that one? Nice reminder through his intervention about Londo's dream of what we now know are shadow vessels in the skies above Centauri Prime. He's always had that component to the future locked in his head, and now he can see the dots lining up. Also quite telling here that Reefa has a line into Morden now. Londo has seemingly lost his exclusivity, which means that whatever Londo has agreed, Reefa could override. Back at the start of Season 2, we had Jakar warning about the ancient enemy, but then getting sucked into the Narn Centauri conflict. Here again, he is involved in giving the only concrete, if limited, account of the Shadow Vessel. Delenn's account is predictably evasive, given what's at stake, and her reactions in this episode are interesting, because she seems almost awestruck by coming head-to-head -head with the Shadows, while Sheridan just sees them as hostile targets. He isn't burdened by history in the same way she is. Here we also get a crash course on the White Star, a really beautiful ship design, although a little marmite for some people. But it's a massively useful tool for getting the main cast off the station and out into the action elsewhere, which we've had little glimpses of before now, but here we see it being taken to a different level. Obviously comparisons will be drawn here to Deep Space Nine and the Divine, but I'm not even going to go there. As the introduction to this season says, the Babylon Project has failed at this point to bring peace. Now it's best place to help bring victory, and that's going to require more proactive steps to be taken. That brings me to another crucial point of plot development in this episode, almost throwaway in its length, but it's a bombshell. Earth Dome is at some level in league with Morden and his associates, as are the Psycor. That means that Sheridan is not going to be able to draw on unlimited help from back home any more than Delenn can. This episode itself demonstrates just what an increasingly difficult time of it Sheridan faces in trying to be both Earth Force and Army of Light simultaneously, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out across the season. Marcus is a fun character, his introduction is quite rapid here inevitably, but he successfully establishes his credentials as a warrior and his commitment to the cause, even if he's quite quiet with it, and his attraction to Ivana is quite obvious in the White Star. Let me just round off briefly by touching on the blockade mines and the tech side of things. I assume these mines are fairly near the gate because you'd need a ridiculous number of them to keep a whole planet secure. I guess taking a route around them is just prohibitive in fuel terms, and perhaps running their gauntlet is a better option than giving a Centauri warship time to intercept you. But you can see where I'm coming from. It's a nice touch having the Sunhawk be able to launch out the auxiliary craft, however, and it gives a nice action opening to the season. 
I don't think we've actually seen a Sunhawk up close before um, before this either. Possibly in Deathwalker, but that's going back some. Obviously, then, we get the introduction of the White Star, and it's quite funny how Glenn is almost apologetic when she's explaining how artificial gravity is old hat for the Minbari, whilst humans still have to spin stuff to be able to do pretend gravity. The White Star is far more than just Minbari tech, though, of course, so the question is perhaps just how Volon it actually is. Its ability to jump without a gate is clearly a massive advantage over other ships its size, and it's seen to be very fast and able to hit hard too. So again, it's really ramping things up, as is blowing up a jump gate in the face of a shadow ship. I remember wondering at the time whether the shadow ship was actually destroyed, because we see the sort of white interference pattern on its skin, indicating it was trying to dissipate the hit, as we saw when the Narn used energy mines against them. But I believe it's assumed dead, which would be the first capital ship lost for the shadows that we've seen to date. So although it's a lucky shot, it's still quite a significant one. It means their ships aren't invulnerable. So it's quite an action the opener, as you might expect to get the new viewers interested, whilst the more than Earth revelation is quite a big deal for the older hands. So the game is very much afoot at this point, and we'll see where JMS takes us from here in the rest of the season. Cheers for now.